Hey, Warlocks. Hey, Warlocks. Are you Hi, there? Yes. How are you doing? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. You see how you see this advertising I'm putting? I'm make, trying to make the people work. <laughs> you see it, right? I guess you have a pretty bad Wi Fi. Yes. See, people can go to the uh, Facebook and just share it. Do you know what I mean? Yes. You're about to change the way you find them. Hey, how you doing? See, I, ch I, I can change. I'm, I'll, uh, maybe I'll put it on a, a little bit. Okay. But, you know, the backgrounds are good to use. And let me put on a good one here. I think people people like the beach. That's nice, huh? Yeah, well, let me. Yeah, so basically, Warlocks, when we start, whenever you start one of these, you, you, you let people in, in the panel, right? You see the panel? Yes. Yeah, you have to you have to give everyone permission. You got to you know to enter. Then maybe there's something automatic. I haven't found it yet. It would be nice if people just came and went right in. But you got to you know let people in one by one. And the yeah. only only job really you have to do is to make sure there's no background noise if you can, uh, and you have to mute people sometimes. When okay. there's uh, when there's noise, I'm I'm sure you've seen that. It happens all the time. Yeah, that's nice background. Yeah, we could utilize the, the time before for advertising or bothering people. <laughs> Let them more and more people come in. Yeah, the... yeah, I'll, yeah. Okay, I'll be back. I got to do some. Uh, like okay. I got to post on YouTube and you know that kind of stuff. Yeah, sure. sure. Okay, I'll be back.
Yes. Hey, hey, Warlicks, are you there? Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, so can you can you host? Yeah. Great, great. And that take charge, take charge, grab that baton. <laughs> what a, so I just only let people in. That's all right. No, all I do is like, uh, I'll just say I'm John Bennett, Neurosurgical TV. I'd like to turn it over to the host. And then you say, yeah, welcome to the uh, Neuro mm -hmm. IMC. So the first two. session is Victor, right? I'm, so I'm sorry? So the first session is Dr. Victor, right? I'm not sure. I'll have to talk to Lewis before. They changed it because there's one neurosurgeon in surgery now, Dr. Gal. But so you don't worry good. about that. You don't worry about that. Lewis does that arranging. You, you're going to have enough to worry about. So don't worry about that. Uh, and, and more or less, you just introduce, uh, you, well, we talk to Lewis, see how he wants to arrange it. I don't know if you is first or not. Uh, and you just basically uh, introduce the speaker. And after the session, you, you lead the discussion. You know, it could be a referral to Lewis if you don't, you know, know it's, if it's protocol, but if it's something specific, uh, any problem, it's just Lewis will be there. And and uh, that's about it. Let's see here. Am I on pin? No, nope, not pin. Oh, nice background. Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, why don't you put some color? You got, you know, you don't, I don't see too much color there. Oh, really? So you yeah, put a little, could, try to get some color. Yeah. Over your, like your pictures. But maybe it's a resolution, huh? That's not carrying. No, no, it's, it's dark. Uh, yeah. It's too dark, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, let's, let me try this now, Warlocks. I mean, I, I want to be an aggressive marketer, you know? And, <laughs> and, uh, and I got some good news too. Uh, yeah, Simon's looking forward to tea. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, Flora's nice. Look at look at this. Uh, Is that? That's Florida. Oh, how long ago? <laughs> a couple of years ago. <laughs> um, years ago. <laughs> Oh, I don't believe that. She's like on a good dress and her hair size is not going to be with It's nice to eat with animals in the background. <laughs> no, it's not. Well, if you notice, none of the legs are in the water. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going to see the picture that uh, she I believe that. that's more professional. Oh yeah, the uh, okay. Let me let me go to the Facebook. Okay, and this for everyone here listening, you can help us market. I'm gonna put up something on the screen, which is is kind of self-explanatory. Let me see here. Mm -hmm. Oh, there it is. Okay. This is essentially, if anyone in the panel waiting now, you can put yourself to work. Go to your Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash johnbennett.md. 
and just click on the share the video because that's a uh, we're live now actually on Facebook on uh, YouTube. So you're basically spreading the word. Here's you are now. You're basically spreading the word of this webcast. Can anybody hear me? Hello. Hey, Yuha, how you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. So how are things? Uh, how are things there? Things are here. Yeah. Uh, there were two new cases in Henan province. 100 million people. Two new cases in last really? week. Oh, huh? Now very strict policy. Going Still, to huh? hospital. Are uh, two cases? Two cases. Oh Even in Finland, they have 200 cases a day. And there's, more that, there's, there's more than that in Miami. <laughs> <laughs> two cases. So, three really? policies. Yeah, it yeah. Really strict, huh? With, the, with, the, with gathering have, groups. No, there the are guards in front of the hospital. They check everyone. Cellulars, you have to wear masks all the time, and uh, and they control every person coming to hospital. Oh, okay. Yeah, this is very strict policy, China policy. This is maybe the only thing you can learn from China. Really? So policy. The policy? It kills. Yeah. yeah the policy, policy, policy here is not consistent. It varies no. from state to state. Uh, and it varies from city to city almost. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. I know this is uh, people cannot tolerate that kind of. Uh, yeah, that's why I think uh, we'll they more. need want to have freedom. But here the policy is extremely strict and they control everything. And uh, yeah, this is how to kill the. You can also imagine when the coronavirus. COVID is spreading here, then it is huge disaster. There's, there's so Lewis, so, excuse me, you are War, War yeah. is here too. You, you, yeah, I, I see, Warlux, hi, hi, Warlux. Yeah, yeah Warlux is, mm -hmm. uh, is modern. Yeah, I know, I know her skills in many yeah. ways. She's very helpful in advertising, but she's also a great artist and great neurosurgeon and hardworking oh. lady. Um, well, I'm putting her to work as a host, so yeah. she's, yeah, she's does great. Many, great. she does many things. Hey, hey, Lewis, how you doing? Lewis, how are you? Very well. Hi. Good morning. Okay. Hello, good morning. Lewis. Hello. Good evening from here. So, yeah. how we how we gonna arrange it, uh, Lewis? So what's the order of speakers? It's uh, Yuha, Professor Henry, and you have okay. more time. Then uh, Rene Chapo. Rene is next. You got yeah. that name? You got that name, Warlock? Uh, Warlock? And, and uh, Gula, as, when I finish the procedure, also. Oh, and he's going to be last. He's in he surgery. Had a, he had the procedure beginning right. now. Yes. He can be last, though, right, Lewis? He, if, if yes, he I'm myself yeah, last. It is good plan. Good plan. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. You know, we'll just go. Yes. We'll just uh, go by ear. I check she's, she's fast uh, endovascular surgeon, Gula. <laughs> she, yeah, she's, not, she's, not big no, she's not fast. Very skilled and long, long time experience. Yes. His yes. name is Hungarian. Yes. He was working in Sweden, but now he's in Denmark. Yeah, yes. I know. I know. You are more time, uh, Gula, uh, Juha, if you no, OK, that's great. That's great. But I will not, not no more. Take new cases. I have enough cases, so I will. Where are you from? Facilitate announcement. Then I have six very representative videos, and which are rare nowadays. Perfect. For, for example, in China, no facilitate announcements are operated on, and uh, the skills are going down, and it is very rare. Hmm. Rare, rare to do, like last Mohi games. Yeah. I, I present only the uh, special case. 
Okay, that's great. That's great. We, we always, the, always great by you because you have very special cases. Yes, I, I think it's, it's interesting to to to, mm -hmm. to present some particular case. And yeah, yeah, of course. Next week, I like next week. No, in two weeks, the next session, I like uh, you talk with the giant and embrace of the siphon. Uh, the siphon. Erotic, erotic. And I invite, I invite on the same, in the same session, uh, Professor Binshu. Yeah, he's, he, he's a great session, so he should tell his experience with bypasses and direct surgery. But also, he, oh. yeah. he's also hybrid, so he's doing endovascular also. Perfect. I don't know how he can do all the cases. Uh, it was blood cases, direct surgery, and then a huge number of bypasses. Yes. I will um, visit him in December. Uh, Is he John, joining today? John? Yes, yes. I think uh, Binshu will come today. Uh, John, okay. what's, which time when the, the end of the session is? Okay, nueve minutos. No, and the end, how many times? One hour and a half? Uh, no, no uh, those are those in Mary is in Asita. Perfecto. Uh, la, 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 la última charla is in tres horas. Perfecto. Perfecto. I understand a little bit Spanish, so I understand what you are saying. Oh, yes. okay. Even three hours. <laughs> a little bit. Okay. okay. Warlocks, did you get my message? Yes. Yes, uh, I, I made a mistake. <laughs> Does Ben Ben have the link? Let's see here. Let me maybe it's not here yet. Yeah. He's so busy, man. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, let me send a, I'm sorry, I should have sent a link to his email. It was very nice photo which it, you sent Bennett boys. Oh, yeah, yeah, those are all my brothers. Yeah, it was nice photo, really very nice photo. Yeah, it was, luckily we're all in good health. Uh, very, very lucky. We're still very, very <laughs> close for brothers. Usually brothers drift apart, but we stay pretty close. Mm -hmm. Bennett boys. Yeah. yeah, yeah, internet makes it easier, a lot easier to keep in touch. <laughs> uh, yeah, let me... Okay, seven minutes.
Okay, Ben's here. Okay, great. Yeah, he's he's. I don't know if he's putting this on in China. I don't, is he putting it on China too, Cuba? Mm hmm. Is he putting it on in China also? Yes. Yes. Oh, oh great! Yes. Great. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, I'm still translating for you. Okay, oh, wonderful. Super. Super. Well, you know what, Ben, you're going to be busy translating, so Warlocks can ho Warlocks can host, okay? Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Is, is, okay. We'll do that. So you got enough to worry about translating. Okay. Yeah. And that's a big, big role. Okay, Warlocks. Mm -hmm. You're you're being pressed into service. Because ben, because Ben also is he's translating into okay. Chinese. He's nice enough to do that. So we'll let him concentrate on that. So with the sequence again? Yeah, the order for Warlicks is uh, Lewis is uh, Renee for, uh, first Yuha and then Renee, right? Right, Lewis. And then right, you're right. gonna. And then the, you're going to determine if Dr. Gao goes, because he's in surgery, Warlocks. So oh. he may be, have to be last instead of Lewis. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Juha will be first and Luis is second. Okay. Rene Chapo. Rene Chapo from. Oh, Rene Chapo. Okay. I hope you did your homework, Warlocks. Well, I actually didn't give you any homework, so. I just do kind of extend and straight to work after you asked me, though. <laughs> you, oh, really? You came right to right from work? Yes, I just finished like really my uh, first time, but I do kind of extend. Yeah. <laughs> Where are you, are you in Bangkok now? Yes, I'm back to Bangkok, but it's like a big protest in downtown, so. Uh, I tried to finish my work early today, but today is the endovascular day, so it's easy day today for me. Oh, really? You just, are you on call? Um, no, endovascular, we don't have on call, but for tomorrow, I will have uh, to assist bypass and clipping and everything, I guess. So surgery is always busy day <laughs> compared to endovascular day. Oh, really? <laughs> so it's time to rest, huh? Uh, okay, two minutes. See, I got to remove this pin here. There we go. I took the pin off. It was sticking on me. Uh, ben, Ben, I don't think you met Warlocks. Yeah. This is Warlocks. She does the graphics for us. Wow! Great. Thank you. She's wow. a neuro. She's a neurosurgeon too. Ah, yeah, from yeah, Thailand, yeah. From Thailand. Yeah, great. No, she she's not just a doctor that draws. Mm -hmm. She's multi talent, multi talent. Yeah, yeah, she she's she could be an artist uh, on her own. I think she wouldn't have to wouldn't need medicine. It's, it's not my main job. My main job still being a surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> and what area do you like, uh, Warlocks? What area are you favoring? Any area now? Of of course, right now I do uh, vascular, so I do both like surgeries and endovascular, like hybrid surgeon. Oh, okay, yeah, great. I'm I'm same. Today I have uh, <clears throat> four endovascular treatment and the five bypass for more than one. Wow. Okay. Today. Today. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay, yes, Warlock, you have a couple of reasons to pay attention. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when you begin, uh, I will uh, mute myself and. Uh, okay, start we start in one one well. minute. Yeah. One minute. Okay. One minute. <clears throat> Tim, yeah. Tim, Tim, Tim. I'll, yeah, I'll just introduce you first, Warlock. Russia, China, 
Okay, Warlix, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning from Miami Beach. This is Dr. John Bennett for Neurosurgical TV. We have another Neuro IMC, the second uh, bi-monthly webinar run by Luis Lopez Ibor. And I'll turn it right over to not only an artist, but the hostess, Warlix. Welcome, Warlix. Hi, thank you, John. So welcome to our uh, new low, uh, new low IMC session. Today, in which we have four presented by uh, amazing professor. So the first one we will start with Professor Juha and following with Dr. Rainy Chapel and Gurulas and finish with Dr. Louis. So, uh, so okay, Dr. Juha. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, dear colleagues, I will speak about surgery of aneurysms of basilar tip, rather rare subject nowadays because endovascular has taken over this site of aneurysm, aneurysm's most difficult site to do microsurgery. So I'm working now in China, in Zhengzhou, and I'm Provincial People's Hospital. My main experience is coming from Finland, where I retired as a professor and chairman in Helsinki, and now, as mentioned, in Henan Provincial People's Hospital. So the background for that, what I'm speaking is coming from two centers, Kuopio, Eastern Finland, 17 years, and Helsinki as a chairman, 18 years. So what we did in these two centers, we made extremely large, reliable databases with long-term follow-up and with these databases, we could publish a lot profound data and publication and strength of Finland is of course, long-term follow-up, small country, extremely organized and good healthcare and also national uh, register of all the deaths. So we know the fate of all the patients years after the treatment until their death and the cause of death. So in these two databases, there are more than 17,000 patients with 22,000 aneurysms. And speaking about posterior circulation aneurysms, vertebral basilar aneurysms, there are close to 2,000 2, posterior circulation aneurysms. I have operated on myself more than 600 of these cases. What are aneurysms of basilar tip? They are aneurysms of basilar artery at the basilar bifurcation, origin of superior cerebral artery, and P1 aneurysms. These are counted as basilar tip aneurysms. In the Finnish databases, the distribution of the different sites of aneurysms is given here. With the CT angio, with four vessel studies, we found that vertebrobasilar region aneurysms are not 5%, but 6, 16%, because in the former times only selected angios were done, and in the historical series, vertebra angiographies were seldom as they were dangerous. 16%, one sixth of the aneurysms are in posterior circulation in our Finnish database with huge number of cases. And to speak about vertebral basilar aneurysms, posterior circulation aneurysms. So the basilar tip is 45%, vertebra pica aneurysms 45%, and then basilar trunk, vertebral basilar junction, around 10%. And this is coming from my series, 
of more than 600 patients with posterior circulation aneurysms out of a series of more than 6,000 6, personal cases of aneurysms. So aneurysms of basilar tip are, however, rather rare. Five to eight percent of all aneurysm patients. They are usually small or medium size. And these aneurysms have three different directions. Anterior direction, upward direction, posterior direction. Posterior direction is most difficult to treat as it is close to the extremely important perforating branches of basilar bifurcation. Bacillar superior zebra artery aneurysms and P1 aneurysms are usually free from the perforating arteries. This is very important for open microsurgery. Dr. Drake was first to note the importance of the perforating branches. He made his first bacillar aneurysm 1959. The first bacillar artery aneurysms were operated by Oliver Kruner and his student Boom in Sweden in 1954 without microscope. And this is like a miracle. Aneurysms of basilar tip, very small aneurysm without any substance in there because of their small size and giant aneurysms are very difficult to treat. To preserve perforators is crucial. If you damage even one perforator, the patient might have severe neurological deficit, tetraparesis, tetraplegia, cranial nerve deficits, low consciousness, and when the patient is so crippled, so death is coming sooner or very late. We usually assess our mortality at one year because of the good follow-up as many crippled patients die in complications of their bed rest. We have diagnosed, uh, here is carotid bifurcation, sorry for that, it should be basilar tip here. Good quality CT angio has been main diagnostic tool in Helsinki since 2000 and we could make extremely well high level CT angios and without with them we could do very uh, sophisticated operations without DSA. To treat aneurysms of basilar tip, I think proximal control is a must. It might be that some surgeons are operating without temporary clips, but I feel safe with temporary clips, like Dr. Drake said, temporary clips make the surgery even a pleasant one. And there is a lot of truth in that. You should put temporary clips on basilar artery, even on both becomes two or three temporary clips. And then you should do utmost careful dissection of the perforators like mentioned, hurting even one perforator may make the patient not die, but crippled in the bed and maybe late death. Should take care of contralateral P1. The clip should not be too long, must be 1.5 times the base of the aneurysm. This is important. Then we have different aneurysms of basilar bifurcation, sorry, reading here, carotid bifurcation. You have elective aneurysms, unruptured aneurysms. Then you have acute cases with ruptured aneurysm, aneurysms. We used to do also basilar tip aneurysms as acute surgery and as emergencies when the patient has many repeated bleedings in the same time. We operate it even in the nighttime, like one giant tip aneurysm was operated 10 o'clock beginning 10 o'clock p.m. and finished one o'clock. This means that you have to have extremely good team. And then you have advanced approaches for large 
giant and fusiform aneurysms. Planning, of course, the crate of the patient is extremely important. I was operating also poor crate patients, even crate five patients, old patients. Intracerebral hematomas are no problem in basilar tip aneurysms because they never have intracerebral hematomas. Why? Because I think if they have bleeding inside the brainstem, the patient will die immediately. I have seen only one patient with hematoma in the brainstem and the patient was in poor condition, but this one we could help. But you are never operating on these cases because of expanding hematomas. Like mentioned, very small and giant aneurysms are very difficult. Each type of aneurysms, you have also dissecting fusiform aneurysms. You have to take the utmost care in analyzing the pictures. Then you have ruptured, unruptured patients. And what is extremely important for microsurgery uh, is atherosclerosis, calcification at the base of the aneurysms or in the parent vessels because you need temporary uh, clipping, proximal control. And then you have to take a look on the aneurysm wall. What is the surgical strategy? I have done most of my cases by subtemporal probes, began in 1980s to do after reading the book chapters of Drake and Peerless. I did my first rather large two centimeter bacillar tip aneurysm by subtemporal approach and it went very well. Then I thought this is not so difficult as told but the later experience was explaining different. In subtemporal approach, you put the patient in Parkinson's position you have to have always spinal drain because you cannot come to the CSF spaces without retracting heavily the temporal lobe. Dr. Drake used always to ask when he came to operation room, is the brain slack? And if the brain was slack, the operation was canceled and was done next week. Now it is different. <coughs> if you have High location of the aneurysm above posterior clinoid, then you have to do transylvian approach because you have to retract too much temporal lobe. And then the position is supine, not park bends. And in this supine position, you don't have any need for lumbar drainage. If you have multiple aneurysms, I mean, if you have aneurysms at the basilar tip and then anterior circulation aneurysms you want to treat at the same time, then you have to do transylvian approach. And then dissecting toward the aneurysm, you creep slowly with forceps and sucker subtemporally to the dentorial edge. And when you come there, then you open the arachnoid spaces and then you get CSF and then you are safe. You can suck slowly, CSF, and the brain is getting slack. <coughs> in many times I cut, or in most cases, tentorium behind trochlear nerve. And when the brain is slack, you have to put a broad supporting spatula below temporal lobe. I used to operate in Helsinki without, without spatulas, but here in subtemporal approach, in most cases I was using and it was very helpful. Then you do sharp dissection and the most important thing in the anatomy is that the oclomotor nerve is the highway to basilar tip. And there's, there might be many anatomical variation that oclomotor nerve is always going between P1 and superior cerebral artery to the brainstem and following the oclomotor nerve, you will come, come to the basilar tip and then you have to use temporary clips according to my experience on basilar artery and becomes because if intraoperative rupture happens, then the gap is extremely small 
and you may heard important structures. There was no difference in our database in intraoperative aneurysm rupture, in anterior circulation, uh, aneurysms in the outcome, but in the posterior circulation is different. So to take utmost care not to rupture the aneurysm during the operation. Then in acute surgery, you might have red, angry, swollen brain. You have to change it to slack brain. And this means you have to have spinal drain, very good neuroanesthesia. I'm seldom doing ventriculostomy, but in some cases, the patients have ventriculostomy because uh, before my surgeries, ventriculostomy is done because of acute hydrocephalus. So I begin with the videos. Here is first case. Edited by Johan Schoko, doing his PhD now, November 10, on pineal tumors. This is a ruptured basilar bifurcation aneurysm, direction forwards, upwards, rather small, base, three millimeters. This means that the clip must be five to six millimeters long. Short clip. This is subtemporal approach, right side. Then opening the door, and you see a lot of blood in the subarangal space coming now to the tentorial edge and searching for trochlear nerve incision behind trochlear nerve. And you have to take care that you don't hurt superior cerebral artery and trochlear nerve when opening the tentorium. And then I do this trick to attach tentorium to the middle fossa base. Dr. Drake used to put the clip here, but it is very difficult to put, the, put a, a stitch here. So I'm using these clips and now cleaning here and going slowly down. We have spinal drain, otherwise you should not do. And this is a colomotor nerve. This is the highway to the basilar tip. When you follow that, you will come to the basilar tip. You will find posterior communicating artery here, then P1 and superior cerebral artery. And this is the anatomy. And it is deep and small cap. It's deep and small cap. This is the difficulty. This is oclomotor nerve covered with fresh subarachnoid hemorrhage. I was not cutting it, I was just moving it, and now I dissect towards basilar artery. We see posterior cerebral artery and superior cerebral artery, and now temporary clip is going on the PCAM and then to the basilar artery. And slowly, carefully, between the perforators. And then dissecting aneurysm neck. As mentioned, this aneurysm is directed anteriorly. It, has, it is not bound with perforators, so you can put a clip free there. The main danger is here if the aneurysm tip is attached to clivus, so it may rupture intraoperative. This is the main danger here. So now we have the first clip here. We check the situation. It looks good. Now I should take the temporary clips out. P come, clip is coming out. And then carefully taking the basilar temporary clip out and now checking the situation. And we see here the left, we check also the contralateral P1 and Doppler control. And then ICG is made usually here. I cut the aneurysm. We do, did a lot of basic research, cutting the aneurysm fundus for basic research and many 
good papers and PhDs came from there. Now I cut the aneurysm. This may is certainly sure that this aneurysm is done, is taken, and then I add one clip, like I say, to sleep better, to be sure. Here is papaverine. I think there are two clips now. Yeah, now the broad spatula is taken out, and then we remove the, the tentorium clips, bleeding, fibrin glue. Here, control angios, CT angio. There seems to be two clips. And uh, the patient had, the day before my surgery, had a ventricostomy. So, this was acute surgery in Pasilla tip aneurysm. Next case. This is ruptured right basilar artery, superior cerebellar artery, aneurysms, heavy saprarachnoid bleeding. And we, we go to this aneurysm from the side where the fundus is directed, means, of course, that you are coming in the direction of the bleeding point. Dr. Drake did some cases from contralateral side. I have never done. This is spinal drainage. This is position, back, back bends position and opening here. One, I used to do craniotomy with one burr hole. And now going down, right sided approach, right temporal lobe retracted, trochlear nerve identified cutting the tentorium again, taking care of the trochlear nerve and below tentorium, superior cerebral artery and attaching the tentorium sleeves to the middle fossa with microclips. So this is also a good case, a lot of blood in subracnoid space, like mentioned, the oculomotor nerve is the highway to the basilar tip and means also that when you are doing a, a direct surgery, it may be manipulated and the patient has oculomotor palsy on that side. Here is the highway oculomotor nerve and now we see already the aneurysm and there is a temporary clip on basilar artery took away after clipping. I usually use here J-formed clips because the superior cerebral artery is coming from the base of the aneurysm. So this is comfortable to put a clip taking whole base. And you may add second one. Uh, anatomy looks rather complex, especially because it is acute surgery. A lot of blood in subtranquil space, reposition, the change in the clip position to save the superior cerebral artery, posterior cerebral artery, and then the base of the anonymous is taken, like you see, basilar artery here, superior cerebral artery filling. This is important. This may be occluded and perforators, of course, extremely important. So taking, going back, beginning to close, taking the, those clips away, and here you have post-operative picture. Aneurysm gone, patient doing well, at right, slight oclomotor palsy after surgery, but they always recover. So, next case. This is, I think, unruptured basilar tip aneurysm. And so, the anatomy can be 
more clear seen more clearly seen now we are subtemporal right side again and in this case we had to change the change the clip position many times oclomotor nerve again leading to the basilar tip we see right become very large in this case fetal type and then sharp dissection and going towards basilar artery main part of the dentorial division is done to come for the proximal control to have a good approach to basilar artery here you see temporary clip is going in place in basilar artery and you have to put this between the perforators <coughs> and then we should put also temporary clip on the large pecan i think but now we are dissecting the anorism base sub dissection of the arachnoid still continues left pecan and posterior cerebra, cerebral artery are dissected here and we put two more temporary clips on both pecans you have to put of course the control temporary clip first and now we go once more temporary clip on basilar artery you can take the temporary clip out so to give blood circulation the drake pls series the total occlusion time if it was below 15 minutes so it was safe because in basilar artery you have collateral circulations different from middle cerebral artery aneurysms and now we go for the aneurysm base first clip going here and like you see it is a ring clip to have the posterior cerebral artery inside the fenestration length of the clip 1.5 times of the base of the aneurysm now you don't see the aneurysm extremely well you have to use your brain eyes your experience and now you see how the this is posterior cerebral artery is obstructed with the clip so we have to do everything again I take the temporary clips out check the situation but you can clearly see now of course retrospective you can clearly see now that the origin of posterior cerebral artery is occluded and we use Doppler no sound ICG no filling so we have to do quickly something replace the clips one of the important things is when you have a clip in place don't take it immediately out but use it use it to help your next clipping here in this case you have to travel with the clips it means more distally from the base of the aneurysm so the strategy will be you put the temporary clips back and both peak arms and basilar artery and then you put let the first clip this rather cool but it's occluding origin of posterior cerebral artery you put about that another clip and then take the first one out this is the strategy and extremely helpful helpful if you take the clip out then you have the same situation then first time clipping now second clip is going there taking the first clip out and here you have to be careful because they clip 
clips may be attached, but you see that the clip is coming out and the posterior separate artery is opening and then taking the temporary clips out slowly, always slowly, because you may hurt structures when you try to take them quickly and you should op open the temporary clips slowly. If there is bleeding, then you can close the clip because it is uh, still on the place. Bleeding may obstruct your view and you cannot put the temporary clip back. And now Doppler checking shows that the posterior separate artery is, is open. Checking other arteries, posterior separate artery below that, superior separate artery and basilar artery and checking the perforators. Here you see a big perforator. It is inside the fenestration of the clip. We check carefully and this is ICG. You see that the superior separate artery is open and then the perforator is also open. This is very important. If you lose one perforator, the patient is invalized. Here, the perforator is open, beautifully open and you can be another normal feeling. So this is how it should go. But here is a complicated procedure because main artery, posterior separate artery was occluded at the origin by the first clip. And here, the situation, we put papaverine in surgery cell, oxy cell, and then check the situation one more, once more, the hemostasis, and then going back, taking again, putting glue here, or hemostasis, and then going backwards, checking the situation. This is the situation after operation. Careful, retraction of the temporal lobe, no lesion in the temporal lobe, and then taking the clips out. And that's usually bleeding, venous bleeding, and you stop it with glue. So this was a complicated procedure. You see the temporal lobe looks nice because of the spinal drain and extremely good anesthesia. So let's go to the next case. Again, edited by Johan Schokwe father of this 1001 video series. Here is a giant aneurysm, giant basilar superior cerebral artery aneurysm against subtemporal approach, temporary clips. What is here especially important? The aneurysm base is extremely small, even it is giant, giant aneurysm. So you see it is, I'm dissecting some perforators out, super separate arteries below the clip now, and rather small clip is going on the base of the aneurysm, checking the situation that temporary clip stick out and be calm. And then we take the basilar temporary clip out. And this means flow is back. Flow is back. Slowly opening the clip. Why I'm putting here one small temporary clip? Once more, I put on the basilar artery temporary clips. I'm not happy with the first clip. Must be deeper or longer. Yeah. Must go more deep. Reposition of the clip. And checking the situation. Temporary clips slowly out, carefully out. 
because the clips are close to each other. So you may hurt the other clip and have catastrophic lesions. So carefully taking out. <clears throat> and now the situation looks good. And we made ICG and control and the aneurysm is gone. Next case is a giant basilar aneurysm, unruptured aneurysm, 68 years old lady, has also MC aneurysm, but we were treating this aneurysm first. Again, right-sided subtemporal approach, high magnification to see better, division of the tentorium behind trochlear nerve, attaching tentorium sleeves to the middle fossa and then going down, you see the basilar artery, that kind of aneurysm you can never clip without temporary clips because it is huge size. So, and now opening the aneurysm. And now you cannot come back. You cannot come back. You have to go for clipping. If you open the aneurysm, you can, you are, have to do, you have to do. So you cannot say this is inoperable. You have to do first clip, usually ring clip, fenestrating clip, Dr. Drake's teaching, because they are not slipping away because of the fenestration. And then you cover the fenestration with other clips. Here I'm traveling with the clips more proximal. This bleeding now from the aneurysm, and there's also venous bleeding. This aneurysm was unruptured. It is not yet done because the aneurysm is bleeding where I opened it. So I have to change the clip position. Actually, the clips were in the beginning too short. So I had to take longer clips to have all the base out. And I take the ring clips. Now the first ring clip out and then final solution is two long straight clips on the large base of the aneurysm. Still some venous bleeding. No more aneurysm is no more bleeding because the base has been taken. And this is ICG after operation, super artery open, then Doppler checking. And these are post operative images, angio, perfect clipping of the aneurysm. Patient was doing well and recovered well. There is one more case. This is, oh, sorry. No, now coming. This is a patient, giant basilar tip aneurysm. If you coil them, they are com coils are compressed to the end of the aneurysm, are buried inside the brain stem. This patient had tetraparesis, was crippled, had cranial nerve paresis. And this is because the package of coils is buried inside the brain stem. So there seems to be enough base left for a good clip, I made now presigmoid approach to come closer to the aneurysm. And here you see the trochlear nerve in different positions. Then I'm dissecting There's a lot of scarring because of the earlier rupture of the aneurysm, but I can manage uh, dissecting the, the base. You cannot take the coils out because they are buried inside the brainstem. I have seen in a foreign publication discussion that you should take the coils out of the brainstem, but this is, this is impossible because they are deeply inside the brainstem and there's a lot of scarring. So you should not even try. But here you see that there is a good base of the aneurysm. One or two difficulties are there. Perforators, perforators are there. There's a big perforator close to the aneurysm base. I'm dissecting 
the analysis with scarring, carefully dissecting the treating doctors from abroad was with me. And I think we did good job in this case. These are Kamiyama schizos, very good schizos, expensive and break easily. So this is one of the disadvantages, but splendid instruments. So now I'm dissecting, dissecting, and then I should put the temporary clip on the basilar artery. Uh, dice is still dissecting the base of the aneurysm with dissector. If you can push this dissector in place, then the clip can go also in this hole. This is very important when the micro dissector is going like that, then you can push the same size clip. But here I'm using also a larger dissector to compress the anorosal base. And like said, the first clip should be a ring clip. And this is how it goes here and leaves perforator, the big perforator inside the fenestration. And I push one more clip here. one more ring clip to take all the base and leaving the perforator inside. So now there are two ring clips. I trust that the anus wall is so thick that it is occluded and we will do after Doppler checking, we will do ICG and see that the anus is no more filling and Superoceptor artery, the perforators and posterior artery are filling, checking, 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 replacing the clip. Taking a little bit higher to save the perforator inside the fenestration and checking with Doppler again. Carefully checking all the arteries, checking on the microscope, the perforators, and then doing IGT after taking the temporary clips out. Here, you see. The perforators feeling beautiful, of course, post-operative images are disturbed by a large number of artifacts here. What happened to the patient? We did good surgery, but the patient was even more crippled after surgery because I think one small perforator was uh, obstructed by our operation. We cannot see clearly because there are so many clips and coils. What happened that the patient was in worse condition after operation and remained bedridden after operation long time. We count for deaths, all the deaths after one year, even suicides and this patient's fate. I don't know exactly because he went abroad. So the question is, of course, here, can I do it again? Can I repeat it safely? Or can someone who is younger learn it? Learn it? So these are the big question of basilar tip aneurysm surgery. There is huge pressure from surroundings, media, colleagues, lawyers, asking for endovascular surgery. Why are do you doing microneurosurgery? This gives a lot of pressure in these operations. So you need good skills, but you need also extremely supportive team around you. No angry eyes, no gossiping around. Everybody in operation room is working for the most important person in operation room. This is the patient. No one else is there so important. 
So good teamwork, no one can do surgery alone. This is Helsinki, wonderful team. Anna-Lena, scrub nurse, without speaking, gives all the instruments so quickly that you cannot follow. The same here in Chengzhou, Henan Provincial People's Hospital, King Chen, looking at the screen, instruments are coming without any discussion, and this is good teamwork, anesthesia, good. No one can do surgery alone. This one you have to remember and remain humble. This is Chicago 1988. I saw all, always this picture because these were my teachers, mentors, Professor Yasakil here, 63 years old, Professor Craig, 68 years old. Take a look on these guys. They still, after thousands of operations, learn anatomy and interest it. And this is working with Dr. Drake, master of basilar, vertebral basilar aneurysm surgery. They made with Dr. Peerless a series of 1,767 vertebral basilar aneurysms, a series never to be repeated in human life. So this is Dr. Drake and Peerless. When I came first time to London, Ontario with my big luggage, Peerless with the glasses came to see me because I didn't find the way. He asked me, can I help you? And they helped me in many ways in my life. Dr. Drake died 1998 in lung cancer with brain metastasis, even he was a pipe smoker. So this was the book we did in Miami nearly 30 years ago. So the question is, usual saying is only stupid people still continue clipping. The question is, of course, in many places, money, 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 because endovascular surgery is extremely expensive and poor people cannot afford that. In Nepal, it was so that they couldn't afford even a clip with ruptured for, for ruptured aneurysm. So, Final conclusion here, centralize these cases in skilled hands, and this is happening certainly. Here is the Drake Peerless series analyzed by me. Final good outcome in close to 900 patients with bacillar tip aneurysms, 84%. My good friend, one of the best neurosurgeons, Ali Christ in Little Rock, has operated. 200 patients with bacillar tip aneurysms with the 2% mortality and more than 90% of the cases with good outcome. And I operated in Helsinki. I operated nearly all the cases, also many grade five patients. I was not thinking on my figures, but tried to save lives. And one of the strengths in Finland is extremely good long-term follow-up. So, your mortality is higher because some crippled patients die late. And these are included in the surgical mortality, but good outcome close to 80% in this uh, non-selected series with age, high age patients, old patients and high grade patients. So finally, especially for the Chinese neurosurgeons, to be the highest level of neurosurgery, you need good skills in surgery and English. So neurosurgery is surgery, teaching and research. And for them, you need English language to publish and to communicate with the world. Otherwise, you remain only local hero. And finally, for the Chinese people, but also other parts of the world, don't save the beautiful, especially female's hair. Don't cut the hair. You can make very small shaving. Chinese practice here, good practice. A little bit taking hair just to do the craniotomy incision. Here, young girl with parietal AVM with hematoma. So you should make 
minimal invasive surgery, minimal invasive haircut. This is my thinking. And to select treatment modality, I still think that perfect clip remains the best treatment, but to put this clip around the base of these deadly sacs needs skills and experience and uh, these, these are difficult to achieve nowadays. Learning curve to treat basilar tip aneurysms, aneurysms with micro neurosurgery is very long learning curve as compared to endovascular surgery. One important thing is in Chinese patients, you have terrible, difficult atherosclerosis in cerebral arteries. This is coming, I think, from extremely common male smoking and fatty food by both genders. So all my videos are in internet, free to see, around 1,600 videos. They are called Hermes Nevi 1001, according to the famous book. And then there's Helsinki Microneurosurgery book in many languages. They are free in the internet to find by searching by my name. I thank I you very much. Hello. Thank you, Professor Juha. <laughs> Yes, Go ahead, Borlux. In the amazing lectures, as always, you not only teach us about your wonderful techniques and tips, but for me, as a newbie, like neurosurgeons that specialize in endovascular and microsurgery, you also all the things beside your techniques as well. That's really helpful. I want to encourage them, neurosurgeons, to learn from you. So uh, from now on, it's time for the floor. If you have your um, ideas or questions that you want to ask professor, you can feel free to uh, ask, or you can share your ideas or experience as well. People are shy at first. <laughs> You're not dying, Warlegs, don't worry. <laughs> Just like in my country, we feel worried. Okay. Hello, Professor Jua. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, I'm Dr. Mathuri. I met you earlier. Congratulations, excellent lecture and very educative to everyone. And uh, there are uh, uh, one or two, uh, there is one suggestion or a comment. Once there is a giant aneurysm of the basal or top, if there is a hybrid OT available where we can place a balloon in the vasular, then probably there is no need to look for the temporary clip on the vasular. Whenever we want, we fill the balloon so there is a temporary clip and then you try to do your job. Under the temporary clipping, maybe for four or five minutes, try to dissect it out. Again, there is a reperfusion for some time Again, the temporary clip by the balloon, and then we do the job and clip. Probably it will make the life easier than what we had been struggling in past. What are your comments on that? Thank you for the comments. I have tried everything in my life. We have tried basilar balloons. They failed. They were leaking, and they were in wrong place. And Ali Chris tried once the uh, basilar the balloon perforated up to the aneurysm. So this is not good advice. This is not good advice. Don't try. I have tried. Okay, thank you very much. Because that's what the endovascular people quote. That they I, can understand. Use it as a I understand. I understand. I understand. I understand. But this is different came. This is different came. You can do good things, but I, th I still trust more on the temporary clip than on balloon. Okay, okay. Nice. Okay, because there are two brains thinking. But the surgeon is putting the temporary clip. When you are two, two persons are cooperating, then there might be some misunderstanding or leaking of the balloon or mis displacement of the <coughs> balloon when the <coughs> operative position is 
Dan, this has happened. This has happened. I have tried everything. So I, I don't recommend to try. Okay, nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have got a vast experience. So obviously, we will have to take what you are uh, recommending. But that's what was the, uh, the endovascular people quote and trying to help the neurosurgeons. So that's how I just wanted to clarify my, uh, say, the uh, confusion on that. I, I'll call it confusion because you are coming up with the idea, with the experience that these are, there may be a leak, then it's not recommended. Obviously, it's not. Ah, this uh, I have tried. I have tried. I found it also a wonderful idea when we, we began to try, but we failed. We failed. So we oh. came back to the temporary clips. Okay, nice. Thank you. Juha. Juha. Yep. Yes, uh, uh, thank you for your, your presentation. Uh, uh, I, I understand your message. The most important is check every time the perforator, no? The perforator. Yeah, this is, this is uh, what uh, Dr. Drake changed. Yes. He understood ah. the importance of perforators, and that's why he was successful in his series. Yes. So, otherwise, I... if you don't understand the perforators, then you will have always uh, always poor results in treating yes. the Bacillanos. Even occlusion of one perforator makes the patient not die, but bedridden and suffer. Yes, my question. Is, my question is: When you are in in, in surgery, you uh, you are possibly to check the collateral vessel with uh, angiofluorescein or or Doppler, but the perforate is very 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 difficult to check. And the uh, the second question is after clipping your anebris in the big size or giant anebris when you decide to puncture the anebris, when you decide to open this anebris. Sometimes you just don't touch or every time you open the anebris. You have that kind of giant anebris you have to open before clipping. Otherwise you cannot do this. I showed told it is no return moment. When you go with the needle or knife inside the aneurysm, then you have to handle and clip the aneurysm. You can, there is no return. There is no return. If you can take a look on the aneurysm and not open it, and then you can go back and say that it's inoperable, but when you open the aneurysm to clip it, and this must be done if you have a giant aneurysm, a large aneurysm, otherwise you cannot clip it. This is, of course, the drawback. Uh, of the micronary surgery, as is also the heavy atherosclerosis when you don't cannot put temporary clips. Then you can use adenosine to stop for a short time the heart. This is, I forgot to mention that I used many times temporary clips and adenosine to have slack situation, arrest situation. So then you can push your clips in place and then the aneurysm is done. To check the perforators, I operate under high magnification and take utmost care of the perforators. But it has happened, you occlude perforators, and like I said, the patient is crippled. Even it looks, surgery may look nice, like the last case with the uh, uh, compaction of the coils in the inside the brainstem. These cases are nearly impossible to treat. So it's uh, difficult to say what you, what you should do. You can push coils and coils and coils and stents and the anus comes back. This is what happens if you make long, long, long time follow up of these cases. So this is a, a difficult area. I think these are the anorosms which recur in highest percentage of all the anorosums. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Warlocks, keep things moving along. Um, yeah. Hello, Professor Yuha. 
I'm always uh, um, privileged to have your shared experience and spectacular um, videos. Well, my, my question is, um, I want to ask you about your personal experience or your opinion in clipping after calling. Do you recommend or it depends on the case? We have published our experience. I think it was 84 cases clipping after coiling, after recurrence. But of course, nowadays, there's progress in the endovascular uh, treatment. Stents have come, so the compaction of the coils is not so common. But I, we have published maybe 10 years ago, 84 cases. Half of them were basilatic aneurysms, which recurrences. So you can search the paper in PubMed with my name and Romani Rosan, I think. Okay. Ros you. Rosana Romani, yeah. Okay. Hello, okay. sir. Can Go I ahead. ask a question, sir? Yes, of course. Hi, Mohammed. Hi. Uh, I Hello. have a question, sir. Uh, Just introduce uh, yourself, please, Mohammed. Uh, I'm Mohammed Shumun Rana, Assistant Professor of Neurosurgery, Dhaka Medical College Hospital, Bangladesh. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your brilliant yeah, presentation. A lot of tips and tricks we have from your presentation, as always. I have a question. Uh, what about the right and left-sided approach to deal with the basal aneurysm? Is there any preference, right or left? I'm doing okay. subtemporal. If the aneurysm is directed like that to the left side, so I go from the left side. If I look at the midline, if it is directed like that or basilar artery is more on the left side, then I go from the left side. And But usually from the right side, because usually the aneurysms are in the midline. But when there is that kind of shift or aberration, then I use the left side. Or basilar superior cerebral artery, if it is directed to the left side, I go to the left side, from the left side. And of course, P1 aneurysm I didn't include because my lecture was too long, but uh, I couldn't occlude. In case of, of course, uh, cannot occlude all the videos, but as I mentioned, you can see all the videos in the internet by searching Hernes 1001. So there are a lot of vertebral bacillar surgeries also. Thank you, sir. In case of BASC aneurysm, is it possible to deal with from the contralateral side? Basilar Which artery, aneurysms? Basilar artery, superior cerebral artery aneurysm. BASC like aneurysm. I mentioned, Dr. Drake did it. When it was a large aneurysm, he went from contralateral side. I have never done. I have never done from contralateral side, but studying Dr. Drake's series, in some cases, he went from the contralateral side, putting a ring clip around the base of the anus. So it is possible, it is possible, but uh, I have never done. Thank you. Okay, I guess we can move on. Uh, Warlocks, can you introduce the next speaker? Thank you, you are. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, Warlock, are you there? Uh, I yeah, guess yeah. Oh, go ahead, Warlock. Go ahead, Warlock. Go ahead. Okay, so next lecture is uh, from Professor Rene Schapo. He's currently work as neuro interventional radiologist in Germans in Alfred's Group Hospital. He have a lot of experience. Uh, please welcome Dr. Rene Schapo. From his talk today, he will talk about his experience in endovascular treatment in basal aneurysms. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Okay. I just put my microphone on. It's better like this. It's a pleasure to be here and to be able to share these discussions. Um, um, definitely, we heard very interesting things. Um, I think, however, that. Um, with all the progresses that have been made, uh, I think that nowadays um, it does not treat in an endovascular way, uh, which raises other questions because I don't want to show only the successes, 
most treatments do on well, and I think it has no interest if I show you uh, lots of pictures with different devices where everything works fine. So I selected a couple of cases where we had problems and we tried to find a way or, or could not to solve those problems. So here we go through um, the first patient treated already 15 years ago, basilar tip aneurysm where coiling was achieved and a stent was placed inside each of the PCAs to the basilar with a result that looks not perfect, but fairly good. And this suppose this result was supposed to last, but one of the end of the recanalize, and you see that six years later, there is a significant recanalization where the cast of coils completely changed. So um, flow diverters, we placed our first flow diverter in 2007. They came on the market in 2008, 2011 was the time. So the patient received one, two, three flow diverters, not all at the same time, which was supposed to clear, to clear it. Um, the flow diverters were put to the right PCA um, there was no PCOM at time of initial treatment, but um, uh, here the choice was made for the right side, probably because it was a better accessible side. And here expectation was high that at least the problem would solve. Three months after the last, there was again a very important outflow or sorry, inflow to the aneurysm. This is flow getting to the aneurysm, which was absolutely not expected. So this shows somehow the limitation uh, where despite uh, increased reduction of flow, this goes together with increased level of anti-aggregation. This is the aspect immediately, um, no, sorry, this is here the control and you see this important inflow. Uh, and when you check, Interestingly, look at this picture here. You see the basilar, the right PCA, but you don't see anymore the left PCA. And remember what I just said before, I can show the pictures initially. Initially, both PCAs came from the basilar. So obviously, now I go back to the pictures here of the You don't see the PCA. But sometimes you see a little bit of flow to the P1 segment left. And um, what can be the reason for this aneurysm to continue to grow? And obviously, this patient must have developed a PCOM, otherwise uh, we would not see this blinking artery on the left side. Um, and again, if we see now how the vessels are, you see that you have a little bit faintly P1 segment and here a PCOM that developed that injects the posterior circulation. So some changes in the vessels and what can explain this aneurysm to grow else than the remaining flow through this P1 segment. And even if this flow is absolutely minimal, this was our hypothesis and anyway, what to do else in this patient? The aneurysm grew a lot, it's to be compared and probably this small leak. So here we chose to go through the PCOM with a microcatheter, and then to go from the PCOM to the P1 segment. Here's the tip of the catheter. And you see between the picture on the left and on the right side that we coiled the origin of the P1 segment. So that this flow, even if faint flow it was only, was not present anymore. So could it be enough to clear the problem? In fact, uh, we expected it, but we were not sure. This is the result angiographically, at least on the follow-up, you did not see that there was some remaining flow. And uh, the follow-up on MR showed that this important edema in the brain stem um, resolved. We have other pictures later on showing that it, it completely resolved. So um, here, <laughs> I wanted to show this patient because point one, flow diverters don't clear all situations. 
flow diverters may reduce the flow, but do they, do they completely block the flow? The answer is not necessarily yes. And the most surprising thing here in that patient is that the flow to P1 was just faint. I mean, we could see it here and then it was gone next second. So it was a very minor flow, but this minor flow kept aneurysm growing in a major way and putting a couple of coils in the right position enabled to clear the situation. And I guess that this is probably one of the reasons for flow diverters to fail. The rate of failures is evaluated something between 10 and 20%, uh, which anyway is difficult because the way to evaluate is usually uh, um, and uh, one of the reasons for the reason to continue to grow or to have some edema is potentially a minor residual flow. And if you find a way to cut it, then it's not inside. Okay, let's switch to next patient. Um, this is a Scandinavian patient where there was a basal aneurysm that blood. It's a young woman. This aneurysm doesn't look so terrific. It's not giant thrombose, it's a small aneurysm. So she was treated and as the neck is somehow large, different devices were used to try to hold the coils in place. So here are the coils in place. Here, a Picodus device was placed and then a little bit of thrombus occurred in this procedure. So obviously some Riopro was given to make sure that no further thrombus occurred. So, and you see that again, very frustrating results because the aneurysm continued to grow. And this is, I think, not so frequent, but we may see this on basilar tip aneurysms. And the result nine months later showed that the growth of the aneurysm was very significant. I mean, the aneurysm nine months later is much larger than what it was before. So uh, this patient was treated again in the same team where uh, a T stenting was achieved. So a stent was placed from the right to the basilar and another stent was placed there. So here was the first stent, here was the second stent in order to avoid, to make a junction and avoid the stent not being properly opened. So here you may see them, it is not so easy to see. But look at six months later, again, a huge recognition. So the enthusiasm starts to reduce and at this point, further treatment was done. Now, a circular device, a so-called web, or even two webs were placed. So webs are super easy to place in, but the level of stability that they give is poor because those webs uh, do compress. There was even a third stent that was placed in the second one. And uh, the immediate result shows stagnation. What is the significance? I don't know, but look at two months later. Only two months, massive recolonization of this aneurysm, as to be seen also here on this 3D view, where these webs are somewhere here, pushed, compressed to, to the more distal part of the aneurysm and this important part. And the question is here, um, what to do or even how to explain how can it be? And of course, what are the therapeutic options? And different surgeons were asked, I mean, here again, to see the material, he was a piconus. So four markers, one, two, three, four. Here an Elvis stent, the first one. Here is a baby Leo stent. Here is the third stent. So which strategy now? Now more flow diverters, more coils, more stents, or what? And in fact, if you look at the pictures, and if you look at AP, you don't really have the answer. But I would say looking at the lateral view of this basilar shows the recolonization, the compacted coils. The first device which was placed in order to hold the coils with a major drawback, potentially, that the stents never opened and never could 
achieve their function because they were compressed to part of the basilar due to the first device in place. So somehow you could think that, I mean, all this material inside, all this material inside uh, the, uh, what is this? all the material inside the vessels, it's just like too much rubbish inside the river. It's, it cannot solve any problem. And, um, and of course, the main problem is the missing opening of the stents. And this is something which is, I believe, um, where is a tendency to under-evaluate how stents are placed. If you have stents where you only see the distal and the proximal part, it happens very frequently. But probably looking at what is placed in order to have it properly placed. I mean, if there is no material, no stent holding the vessel wall at the neck, then the vessel wall is continuing to distend. So now, of course, how to obtain an expansion of the unexpanded stents, or is it possible? And in fact, here um, at that point, I saw the patient and I had the option of first trying to go through the right and left stent to place, to force the material with some coronary balloons and material which are very stiff and quite strong that may help the stents to expand. So after some point, it was possible to open two other materials. And, and finally, here you see that on AP, you don't understand how it looks like, but the lateral view enables to show that now the other part of the lumen was accessed in order to place some kissing flow diverters. But the kissing flow diverters, one is about to be placed. And here at the junction of um, at the basilar tip, there is a missing expansion of the stand. So leaving things like this and deploying the material would make sure that, or at least at high risk for this to thrombose. So it could not be the good solution. We had to take this out to redo some PTAs with coronary balloons and even to place a, a coronary stent to keep this junction open. Here is a coronary stent. And after which you can see that now the flow diverters open properly. And if both flow diverters are open, uh, catheter was jailed in the aneurysm, then you can occlude, uh, occlude completely up to the, to the entrance of the aneurysm, to the neck. And this is the immediate result. Uh, it was a quite long procedure, so I made some ischemic stuff and I created here with too much material in the vertebral artery some smaller distal infarctions, which she recovered quite well. And here is one week follow up and the four months follow up. Uh, I, I know now that the one year follow up has been done and it's occluded in a stable way. So the take home message of this patient here is probably that. Adding more material cannot be an issue as long as the material initially implanted is not doing its function properly. Okay, let's go now to this other patient, which we saw for this aneurysm. Maybe I can show it again. This is basilar tip aneurysm, where there was an endovascular attempt. And uh, the endovascular attempt failed due to a stent that was initially it, but you must believe me, the tip of the arrows are the proximal and distal tip of the aneurysm. Proximal and distal tip of the aneurysm, which means that the stent, which was intended to be placed from the right PCA to the basilar, lost its position and now is pointing to the tip of the basilar aneurysm. So uh, this cannot help. So what to do now? Failed embolization eight days earlier. Should we go on for simple coiling, but improper coiling, not controlling the neck? To add another stent from the left PCA or another stent from the right PCA or retrieve the stent? He was a catheterization to the right PCA, and you may see that while navigating with the cat, this is used on pushing of 
And here, the distal structure of the stent, you may see it here, are against the wall of the aneurysm. This is a very scary image. And definitely bringing the catheter to the stent was not such a good idea. It's still not bleeding, but what to do? Leave it, place another stent. No, finally, the best thing was to retrieve it. And by placing half the stent through the, through the first one, we could retrieve the stent and here we could take it out. So this first stent was removed and we could then remove uh, the material. So this is what was done. Here is the first stent in place while the second one was expanded. Uh, it was holding the first one and both could be removed this way. So now we come to a more satisfying situation where there is no stent anymore. Wonder what should we do? We stop because we're happy to have removed the stent. Should we treat the aneurysm as intended? And uh, I mean, you just took away the stent that was not supposed to be there. So, so we decided to uh, the operator here decided to keep on treating and went to the right PCA as intended initially, started to place one coil, not delivering it, placing the stent. This is not our usual way to do. Usually we have a balloon, but well, the stent was placed and somehow it is okay, but it seems a bit unstable and run, trying to recatheterize to the aneurysm. Another problem occurred that the second stent displaced two. So that's not good. Again, the stent is displaced, so leave it, remove, place the third stent. And here, um, I joined and decided to take the stent out. And the technique we use is to cross with the wire through the stent and then take a second system with a snare, take the tip of the wire, close the snare, and this way it's a hook that enables you, you see here is the catheter that has been brought through the stent. The wire is through the snare. Now the snare is, the wire was not inside the snare, so we must reopen the snare. And then we try with the wire to go inside, which will succeed to some point. Okay, and now we check by occluding the snare, we got it. So now we've got here a stable anchoring and the next step is the is it here or um and the next step here is uh, to remove it and you see by taking both micro catheters you can pull on the stand and take it out So here's the second stand that was removed. And now you can check the question again. Stop, flow divert, stand, balloon. And finally, the technique we usually use is to balloon assist coil. And once the coils were in the aneurysm quite stable, then I added a stand and then we obtain, uh, we obtain the expected results. So um, that's here to show that stents may help us, but they don't only help, and uh, sometimes we may get in trouble, but usually there is a way to help ourselves and to find how to, to control it. Okay, switch to the case number three, and then there's going to be a fourth one, and then I'm done. Case number three is this aneurysm arising at the origin of the basilar, which is uh, filled in by the right VA, by the left VA, and with a specific issue, which is the fact that the diameter of the basilar is much larger than the diameter of both vertebral arteries. The smaller vertebral artery is 2.5, the basilar is 5.5. And how to treat this aneurysm with a flow diverter, which should be the first choice here. Uh, probably it's not so, uh, we have an issue because the material will not hold here very well and so there's going to be an important discrepancy in diameter. So here I chose to make a kissing stenting, which is to have both stents in parallel from the basilar. 
to the right or to the left VA in order to gain sufficient stability here. And here you see that the, the material which is U-shape has been placed like this on the right side. And the left one is about to be placed like this. And this enabled the immediate thrombosis, but the results three months later still showed a little bit of filling. So it was possible to go down the PCOM in parallel to this and to continue to coil the aneurysm. But I want to show the follow-up um, one year and two months later, where the aneurysm is gone. The MR shows that there is no flow. And interestingly, you see that we create two completely different channels here in the basilar, so that um, this here is a channel from the left vertebral artery. And here, this is one the run from the right, and the contrast only makes a bit higher uh, distal to this jet to be seen. But a uh, case where I think that uh, the fact to associate flow, flow diverters, to make a kissing flow diverter was um, an important step. Okay, I'm gonna continue with this patient here, who is um, who was treated in 2016 for this giant aneurysm. And um, after doing different occlusion tests, it was seen that he had very good PCOMs and ACOMs. So because of a good circle of Willis. He had a therapeutic surgical occlusion, which went on fine. Patient was doing well. But look at the evolution of the basilar. Is there any problem? No, I'm sorry. I, need to, I just need to unmute someone. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so uh, the basilar in February had a small diameter, but you see that two years later, it went from three to 10, 12. This is September 18. April 19, it was even larger, getting from 12 to 13. Then in December 19, 17 millimeters, and then even more January, so in March, he had a new angiogram showing that the right side, right ICA was okay. But look at the basilar. And just for you to remember, I showed the basilar initially in 16. And now the basilar in March 2020. What to do? And just for us to remember, he's 16 years old. He's doing perfectly fine. He has no issue. Here is um, here is the three D image where you see that it's not a. I mean, it's a extend distension of the whole artery. There is no neck or whatever that can be seen. Uh, this was in March, and when he came to our institution two months later, you see that the aneurysm even continued to grow. This pouch here was added later on. So is flow diverter an option here? I think that it's technically possible to play something from here to there by doing telescopic, but technical success does not mean that the patient will be doing on fine. And whenever the aneurysm is so large, I never saw a patient where his treatment was successful because at some level in between the struts there's going to be ongoing flow so from strategy no treatments is of course not an option flow diverter is technically possible but the chances of success are certainly very low test occlusion hmm, stent coils none of those solutions seems to be so good however i started to make a test occlusion so you see the balloon here. Access to the distal basilar was not an issue. Occlusion of uh, the proximal basilar, which occluded both sides. And by occluding this, uh, we found out that he has definitely a very good ACOM. 
which takes also in charge of distal posterior circulation with symmetric veins. You see here, the basilar tip is taken in charge. And uh, to do this is not ideal because you increase the level of flow in the remaining vessel, which may even enlarge, but is there really a good solution? Um, this patient was referred from a colleague doing open surgery who asked um, who was able to do a bypass and he did not find someone. So um, finally, we, I occluded here the proximal basilar. And here we are, one side, the other side. And, and this patient did absolutely well. He had not the faintest clinical impairment. We discharged him a couple of days later. And now we're going to see later how he's been doing. But I'm still um, I'm very much afraid. But maybe we can open the debate after the last case I'm going to show on what would have been the ideal management of these patients. Uh, last case I want to show, it's this young girl, young woman, she's 18 years old. She has mild fluctuating symptoms. Here's her MR, showing edema, showing something partially thrombosed. And indeed, she has this fusiform partially thrombosed aneurysm. It may be presumed that the cause of this was at some point a dissection. Um, but this is, of course, only a presumption where, where the idea was hmm, what to do here. Conservative management cannot really be an issue regarding the age and already the edema. Flow diverters from one vertebral artery to the basilar, other. In fact, I chose to make other. I first thought of reverse. Why kissing flow diverters? Just I, just uh, as I just showed, or apparently parent artery occlusion with or without bypass. And we did a parent artery occlusion, so triple artery access, occluding both vertebral arteries and putting her awake with a tube, but still awake, being able to evaluate her. You see a balloon from each vertebral artery where she was doing perfectly fine. Good clinical tolerance, a good angiographic filling of the basilar tip, so, so we did a parent artery occlusion and, and she came awake and she was perfectly well, here's her CT. So at awakening, normal neurologic examination, she had some pain because we had a bilateral excess. So maybe the compressive thing was a bit too strong. And we kept her in ICU to be sure that she had at least a blood pressure of 120 to have enough perfusion through anastomosis. Uh, very anxious, but whether she's anxious or not, I don't know what it changed. She received initially some anti-aggregation because we wanted to keep all options open. And two days later, she acutely deteriorated and made this bleeding. And this bleeding was evacuated with good surgeons, they made a partial removal, but then it started to swell and in the end, uh, she passed over. So is it a hemorrhagic transformation of a small infarction or what has been the cause? Um, maybe flow diverter would have been better, but to have her on integration her whole life is something which also, I think in young patients should be avoided. So, um, Regardless of what we do, all those diseases are really dangerous and, and problems are never so far away and everybody has problems. So hmm, I wanted to share these cases with you and endovascular devices are getting always more fancy, but they of course do not guarantee success. And I think their use must be very controlled because otherwise they may worsen the situation. Thank you, I'm done. <laughs> okay, Warlex. Thank you, Professor Rene, for your outstanding and amazing lectures about the endovascular treatment yes. in the basilar aneurysms. 
uh, especially also share your tip and techniques uh, in your PC presentation through your case. So from now on, I would like to uh, give a chance to the floor. Uh, if anyone have a questions or you have an idea or experience that you want to share, please feel free from now. Be afraid. <laughs> Amazing. No, no comments. Or, I know. No comments or questions for, from anybody? I think it's better in the end of the session because I have many things. Oh, yeah. Okay. If you like, no? Okay. okay very so, good, Warlof. Okay. So let's move on to the next sessions. Our next presenter will be Dr. Uh, Guala Gao. I don't know. Sorry if I pronounce this wrong. Uh, but, uh, Dr. Guala, he is the neuro-interventional radiologist that work in Odessi's uh, University Hospital in Denmark. He is also a remarkable and talented neuro-radiologist. Today, he will give us talk about his experience about endovascular treatment in basilar aneurysm. Please welcome Dr. Guala Gao. Dr. Gao, is your audio okay? I don't think your audio is on, Dr. Gal. Do you uh, unmute him yet? Yeah, he, he has to unmute himself. Okay, I'm, I'm unmuting him. Dr. Gal, you have to unmute yourself. Yes, I do. There you go, there you go. So, so I apologize. University Hospital. This is this was a technical challenge for me, and uh, thank, thank you, you very much, Luis, for for inviting me to this meeting. And um, I just want to tell you that um, I couldn't listen to to Yuha's uh, uh, presentation because I had to finish a case. But I listened to Rene's presentation, and I just want to tell that this was a very good presentation, and he's he's so good that he can afford to just show his complications because everybody will understand that he has such difficult cases that even a complication, we can learn a lot. We can actually learn most of the complications. So I, I have to start with two confessions because I had two misunderstandings. The one is that we should, we should concentrate on basilary tip aneurysms. And the second one that we should speak about 15 minutes. So I have, I have a talk about right 50 minutes about basilar tip aneurysms, but um, please um, um, accept these apologies because uh, I didn't understand the, the point. So uh, let's see if I go forward. I just start with a very quick historical background because uh, everything that we do now was made possible uh, of this. Uh, people who, who, who started uh, the endovascular treatment of aneurysms. And the first one was Serbinenko. He, he put balloons in 1973 in the uh, cerebral vessels. And then Guglielmi, who this, uh, deep, um, developed the, his coils, the detachable coils, and also Jacques Moret, who introduced the remodeling technique. And then came the intracranial stenting, double stenting, flow diverters that Rene mentioned. And nowadays we have also 3D coils, we have the web, contour, and next step. So I will not talk uh, about these uh, ancient uh, techniques, and I will not talk about the web, because I don't use the web, I don't trust the web, but I will give you a, a short uh, um, uh, talk about the other devices. And uh, this, this is the very first case that I had uh, uh, the chance to see 2010, and this patient had a subarachnoid hemorrhage 2003. It was a left MC aneurysm that was ruptured and it was clipped. At that time already, they knew about the basilary aneurysm, but they could not treat it. It was in Denmark. They, they uh, judged that it was too difficult because the aneurysm was wide neck. So they referred the patient to Jacques and he treated the patient 2004. 
So this is a six years follow up 2010. And what you can see, if you see the, the shape of the remnant, I think that Jacques used his uh, double balloon technique and he made, I guess, a very good uh, packing of the aneurysm. But during the six years, the aneurysm, the sac was growing and now the patient has a huge recurrence. And since she bled before, <coughs> This is a dangerous situation, so we have to treat. So what can we do? Now, uh, this is the question, and this is the 3D reconstructed image. As you see, the neck is very wide, uh, incorporating the, the orifice of the right PCA and also a little bit of the left one. Uh, and also the, the, the shape of the remnant is so that it cannot contain coils so that we can occlude without, without uh, uh, supporting device at the neck. And since Jacques, who developed the remodeling technique, he already treated the patient with two balloons, I felt that it would be stupid idea to try to uh, copy his treatment because it will not give us a long, long standing good result. So I decided to try to place double stent, uh, the right uh, PCA bacillary and also the left. And this is the uh, working projection. You see, it was not very difficult to get in the right and place a stand. And at that time, the stands were not very visible like now. We just only saw the distal and the proximal markers of the stands. And then after the first stand, I, I put a delivery microcatheter in the, uh, the aneurysm sac and put another stand in the left PCA and basilary. You see the, the other stent was another type and we cannot see anything of the stent because they were not, they were not visible at that time. And after that, having, having a secured neck, I placed coils in the sac and achieved this packing density. And I was happy with that. And uh, since you have mentioned, I, I listened to his last uh, minutes that all these aneurysms with stents and course they will recur. I'm very happy to show you. This is the final, <clears throat> final angiogram. And I have five years follow up and I don't see any sign of recurrences. I see a very stable uh, aneurysm. And I, I think this is a good angiographic and clinical result. The patient had additional two small aneurysm and after this she wanted to get them treated also so I did it also so now she is done for uh, uh, all, all her aneurysms. Uh, you have also mentioned uh, giant aneurysms how to treat them and I got in the same year <clears throat> this one uh, the lady who, who uh, reported uh, brainstem symptoms and this uh, diagnostic workup uh, revealed a huge giant partially thrombosed aneurysm at the basilary tip. And you can see this is the uh, axial image. The aneurysm was very big. The uh, transverse diameter was over 10, 20 millimeter and the longitudinal diameter was 35. So I said, we can call it giant. You see here, this is the uh, filling portion of the aneurysm and this is a thrombose portion. This is also a challenging case and I think this is very difficult for a surgeon to get uh, rid of this aneurysm. Uh, to explain the brainstem symptom, symptoms, you can see the aneurysm in the middle uh, compressing the brainstem all around and uh, the contrast enhancement in the wall and around uh, the tissue. So there was an inflammatory change in the brainstem. So she was, she was neurologically uh, impaired. This is the angiographic image of the aneurysm injecting the left vertebra. What you see here is that the both PCAs are very small. Uh, and if you see the 3D reconstructed image, it is also obvious that it's very difficult to get into the right one because there is no direct access. And if we do Y stenting, we always have to go to the more difficult one first, because then we have to cross the stent with another microcatheter to go to the left. So I had to get into this one and it was very, very difficult. You see the sizes, this is the lung, it is 
20 millimeter long here and, and very wide also. So what I did finally after one and a half hours fight that I could very carefully navigate the micro catheter and the micro wire into the aneurysm sac. You see here the micro catheter getting a big loop and coming out to the right PCA and placed the stent first into the right after to the left. See here also the stent marker. And similarly to the previous case, here you see the both stents in the, in the PCAs and in the basilary. I could achieve this packing density. Again, very good flow in, in all the branches afterwards and all the perforating are open since endovascular surgeons don't touch the perforators. We don't occlude the perforators. Uh, this is the final angiogram. Everything is open. You see here the small perforating branches. And in this case, I have one year follow up because this patient clinically recovered very well. And we didn't see any reason to do a longer follow up when the clinical symptoms are gone. Uh, all the branches are open here also. And you see the MR, there is no edema in the surrounding brainstem. It is getting smaller. But now I got the idea that I will get in touch with this patient and ask her for a new MR because now after eight years, I would like to see if the, the lower portion that was filled with thrombus, if it, if it gets shrunken. So I hope it will, but I cannot show anything now. So after these two old cases, I will show you a couple of cases that are treated with uh, some new devices that are developed recently. And one of them is the next stand. It's a braided nitinol mesh disc. We place it inside the aneurysm at the neck to support the coils. Uh, uh, nowadays, it is delivered with via an 0.027 microcatheter, and it has um, uh, a, a mesh that permits a second microcatheter to pass through or around its mesh, and and then we can deliver the coils through this. This is retrievable and repositionable, and uh, we can electrically detach upon the completed treatment. Sizes are seven, nine, 11 millimeter, and the 40 millimeter is coming soon. Additionally, uh, the microcatheter sizing will go down to 21. So these will be able to place through the 21, which is a small microcatheter, and only the biggest one, the 40 millimeter, will be the 27 microcatheter. So this is how it looks like. You see the mesh, it is gathered together with an assembly point here, and this is where you can detach. This is, uh, this is the pusher wire, and this is how you can cross it with the microcatheter and the wire and to deploy the coils. So the idea is that it will stay in the sac and no, we don't leave any metal in the uh, parent artery. So this is the very first case treated three and a half years ago. Patient was earlier operated on and she had several aneurysms, one of them the basilary tip. And uh, this was also wide neck aneurysm, the neck was nine millimeter, uh, incorporating the orifice of the right PCA, a little bit also the left. So for us endovascular uh, uh, therapists, it's very easy to access the basilary tip aneurysm because the basilary artery is usually not a challenge. So it's very easy to go with the 27 microcatheter and deploy the stent, the next stent. You can see here frontal lateral view. You see uh, the, uh, the shape of this device. And th since this was the, my very first case, I went through the device with the delivery microcatheter. It was not very easy. So uh, after that, I changed my strategy and I put the, the small microcatheter first, which is very easy, and then place the device afterwards. So what you see here is that the, this is the tip of the delivery microcatheter. And then after that, you push coils and you fill the whole aneurysm with coils. And this is when the next stent is detached. You see the distance between the stent and the pusher wire. It, it is a five seconds detachment time. 
and this is the the final angiogram. You see all the branches are open, the aneurysm is packed, and I have an early follow-up on this patient after five months. You see the shape of the coil package is the same, and the aneurysm is totally occluded, and additionally, the right P1 segment is also occluded. Is it a problem? No, I don't think so. On the contrary, this is a benefit because it means that the whole aneurysm is totally occluded and the right PCA will fill through the fetal orifice of, from the carotid. So we got the best possible treatment uh, result because this aneurysm will never recur. So this was my very first case. And after that, I treated additionally uh, cases like this one. This was a 55 years old lady. She was sick. She had a pulmonary cancer and uh, they performed an MR to see if she had metastatic lesions in the brain and found this huge aneurysm. And uh, even if she, she had a limited lifetime, we decided to offer her um, um, that she could live as long as she could manage with another disease. And if we offered her the treatment, and this is the aneurysm. You see that the, the neck is a little bit oblique. It makes it a little bit more challenging than the, the straight one. The aneurysm is big. It's 16 millimeter long and uh, 12 millimeter wide, but it doesn't make a big difference. If we can control the neck, we can treat the aneurysm. So here I place the small delivery microcatheter first and the bigger one afterwards, deploy, the stent at the neck. And uh, it's a little bit difficult to see, but it's there. And what is interesting is that this device has significant flow diverter effect. So you see here, the flow is uh, getting down in the sac while all the other branches are well flown. It is due to the flow diverter, intrinsic flow diverter effect of the device. It, it explains why the follow-up results are always better than the, when we finish the treatment because the coils and the uh, device work together. So this is the late, uh, it's a late capillary early venous phase. You see the stagnation in the sac. And uh, this is the first coil. Then uh, we follow and pack the whole aneurysm. And what is interesting after the first coil, the stagnation is even more significant. And this is what I want to show you very interesting. This is the last coil. This is a small one, two by eight uh, coil. The interesting is that this coil is not uh, distal to the next stent because this portion of the aneurysm could not be covered by the next stent due to the shape of the, uh, the aneurysm. So, but it is possible to fill this portion outside the next stent because the next stent will help to keep the coil in place. So this, I was very happy. And, and since the technique allows us to show the last coil, I thought that it is in interesting for you to see also. So this is the final angiogram. You see all the branches are open. I treated this patient in the spring and uh, she lived additional six months. She was close to do a follow-up, but uh, we didn't want to press her. So she passed away due to his uh, pulmonary cancer. So I will not be able to show you any follow-up on this one. So uh, when we had this initial success, then the company uh, gave some information to, to, to the uh, neurosurgical community about this device. And this is a case from uh, Canada, Edmonton. This was a huge uh, uh, recurrence of a basilary aneurysm, basilary tip aneurysm that was treated long ago. I don't know the exact time of treatment and the patient was lost for follow-up. What you see here, the, the aneurysm is widely open. And again, this is an imminent risk for a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So I got the images, first I got these images on my phone asking if I thought it would be possible to treat this with, with next stand. And the only thing I could see is that was that 
those PCA, PCAs are, were very small, tiny. The neck was not extremely wide, but the aneurysm was very wide. It is impossible to do it without a supporting device at the neck. So I thought it could be done if we placed an 11 neck stand here, I thought it could be done. So we scheduled the treatment and I traveled to Edmonton. And then we, having the lessons from the previous cases, we put the delivery catheter deep in and packed the distal portion of the aneurysm first with coils, then placed the neck stand, what you see here at the neck. And then we could achieve this perfect packing density of the whole sac. And this is the final angiogram. And we have nine month follow up of the case, which, which uh, shows um, still good uh, result. These are, the, um, these are the PCA orifices. So this is not a recurrence at the neck. Uh, so I think this is also a very good result. So I talked about the next stand, which is here. The same company, the Sirius Endovascular, has another device, which is called um, Contour. And the difference between these two is that the wires in the contour are thinner. Uh, we can see, and you see, this is much tighter mesh. Uh, so the, core, the, the wire mesh is much tighter. So this device can occlude the aneurysm on its own. But here we have to go through and put coils. So I had, this is a short overview. So the one, the contour has 144 wire by the next end 64 and the metal surface area is, is uh, bigger here. Uh, these are the same size devices. So this would be capable to occlude the aneurysm on its own. So see how it works. This is a very first case. This was a, a patient after a subarachnoid hemorrhage treated in, other in, in another institution and uh, the follow-up showed significant neck remnant. So when you see the shape of the aneurysm, you will realize that it is very, very difficult to offer any, any conventional treatment option for this patient. And finally, we realized that the contour would be the best treatment option for her because, because of the sizes of the vessel. So this is the basilary artery, which is very narrow. This is the original angiogram. This is the uh, 3D reconstructed image. And this is the treatment result in the other institution with somewhat loosened, uh, uh, loose packing here at the neck. And not a big surprise that uh, follow up at uh, nine months showed significant remnant. So what to do here? As you see here, all the sizes are very, very small. So here it's very difficult to place uh, uh, several devices here. So what we saw that if we can get in with the O27 microcatheter in the sac and place the contour here, probably it could achieve the, the results what we want. See here the size of the 27 microcatheter. Going through this small portion, it would not allow any other device, any other microcatheter. So this is the contour, this is the smallest contour placed in place. Contour detached. Final angiogram, the flow in the sac is still the same. And follow up at seven months, see here that the, the uh, open portion of the aneurysm is much smaller and actually the contour device is here and this portion is necessary to feed. This is a superior cerebellar artery. This is not a PCA. Um, so this, this is a good result again. And uh, uh, this can be even better with longer follow-up, which I will show you in the next case. This is a 64 years old female with a quite big uh, basilary tip aneurysm that we decided to treat with the contour device. And uh, you see here the sizes, the neck was seven millimeter in this uh, projection, the frontal projection, but in the lateral projection, it's much bigger because we don't see there was a portion of the aneurysm here in the frontal. It is not filled here on the 3D image. 
but it is filled on the uh, ordinary angiogram. So you see here that the neck was much bigger than that what the company uh, gives like the largest diameter, 8.5. And they were not happy to treat this patient because they were not, not convinced that the device could, could uh, cover the neck and could get good results. And what I told them that please give it a chance. And then they agreed. So what we did, we placed the last, the biggest contour, 11 millimeter in the sac. And then this is the immediate angiogram afterwards. And we waited 25 minutes. The 25 minutes showed that the device, uh, the position of the device was stable. There was stagnation in the sac. You see here, slow flow. This is late arterial phase and detached the device. Took back the patient seven months after it was still not occluded, but analyzing the angiogram, we can see that the flow diverter function, it works. So the inflow is much slower and the stagnation is much more uh, uh, than it was in the beginning. This is the lateral image, the same. So I was not very happy, but I said, probably it can get better. And the, the problem with this patient was also that she was on, still on double platelet inhibition. So this is the next follow-up at 18 months. And what you see here is that there is hardly any inflow, probably a very small at the base. This very small portion of the aneurysm is outside the contour. So everything that is distal, to the contour, it's occluded. So it's very good result. And we have also the 3D reconstructed image that show that this small portion that is visible also here, this is outside the device. So uh, I think this is the last case that I will show you. It's a very difficult aneurysm. It's a relatively young male. He had multiple strokes from the posterior circulation and the MRA showed this aneurysm which is the 3D reconstructed image shows that the neck is extremely wide. Gula, Gula, no, I don't have too much time. Okay, okay, so let's show just, I put the device, the contour, put yes, some points. This is the final angiogram and I'm done. Thank you very much. Sorry. No, sorry. don't worry. Sorry. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, Warlock, you wanna make the transition? I'm not seeing anybody else. Whatever. Thank you for a wonderful talk from Dr. Gurlars. So uh, maybe keep the questions for uh, at the end of the session. So yeah. next speaker will be Dr. Luis Lopez, the yeah. you know interventional radiologist. So he will present the next lectures. So welcome. So I stop my my sharing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh... Okay. It's okay. Say, sí, perfecto. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, the the professor for your presentation. I don't have too much time. I like just to present some case. I think it's a, it's a very interesting case to to discuss the the another presentation. My first comment. Uh, no, sorry, just a minute. My first comment. Okay. My first comment is when I start the endovascular technique to treat the aneurysm, the, uh, the initial case the, is the basilar tip aneurysm or terminal carotid because it's very easy to navigate. But the question is, when you put the coil, it's depending on the size. It's different to, to understand the small aneurysm to the medium or big size aneurysm because the aneurysm every time grows because it's flow dependent. The inflow is the most important. And uh, just a minute, the endothelization is not early six week. And this endothelization is not 
is not easy or totally, totally uh, complete in bigger animals. This is the reason with this regrow the animals. And the, the coil in sack, you are more pressure in the sack when you are coils. The flow come here, the pressure is different when you are the coil. This is the reason when many animals regrow after coiling. This is one point. This is the standard medium running breeze, the balloon remodeling technique, and treaty. This is good, but sometimes the patient recanalize. One special case. This patient have a dissecting a, tro dissecting a thrombus of both carotid, right and left. And they have an, a small aneurysm in the top, basilar top. You have the posterior communicant artery, you have the middle cerebral artery, you have the posterior communicant artery, and the middle cerebral artery. So you put on the coils with balloon remodeling and have sometimes problem to when you deflate the balloon, the coil migrate. Why? Because you change the anatomy. The material of balloon is very stiff and when you deflate you change the anatomy of this. This is the reason I prefer to use the, the stem, the standard stem. This is the anevrims, this is the work, uh, work projection, First of all, I treat it to navigate in the posterior cerebral artery to place the balloon or a stem. Secondary, I check in the posterior communicant artery and middle cerebral artery. I coil in only one stem. And this is the result. And the occlusion. This is another case. We I decide to use double stem. Why? Because sometimes I don't know where is the initial part of the neck. I don't know if it's here or is here. This is the reason when I present the case. Uh, René Chapo or present the case Yuha, uh, Yuha Gula. Some case when you occlusion the, the vessel, the posterior cerebral artery with very close to the neck is efficient. Is the, sometimes it's efficient this treatment. The risk is the infarct, but it's efficient. In wide neck aneurysms, I prefer to use double stem. This is the CT reconstruction. Every time I need open cell here with balloon, this is axial view. And this is the control. A good result. Okay. This is another case. Why is, is the, I need to use is three months mild, acute phase, anti who's five. I use eight coiling with a micro catheter only and fiber coil to the neck. This is the, 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 the only treatment for this. This case is a case treated by myself in 1994. And this, that moment is the early moment to treat it with the GDC. 
this patient not in notified. Sorry. This is the clinical symptom. And you see in the scanner, CT scanner, you are the hypodensity in the brainstem and mesencephalo and dilatation of the temporal ventricle. I decide in this moment, because the, this aneurysm is very, is giant. This is the point of rupture. This is the mass, mass effect in the perforate branch. At this moment, and this, this is the inflow. The first treatment for me is to place one balloon in the dominant vertebral artery and close this artery to decrease the flow in the aneurysm. One week later, come, I catheterize the aneurysm and coil it. Okay, and this, this treatment and this some satisfactory, but every every six months the patient come and the reopening the neck, reopening the neck. Finally, I decide to close both the second vertebral artery with a balloon. And reverse the flow in the basilar vertebrobasilar system. This treatment is performed in 96. This is the patient in 20, 2005. Totally cure and no reopening the analysis. Reverse the flow. Another patient, 30 year old, this patient is from Colombia, Medellin, with Dr. Vargas, coiling. Finally, I decide to close the neck and the tip of basilar artery. Look this. And you have the collateral circulation. The patient is stable, no regrowth, no flow diverter, no web. I, li I like the, my present, present presentation. No talk, every, everybody of web device. I think the web device is nice device, but you are many, many, many recanalization. Another patient have a P1 and basilar tip and every This is the posterior communicant artery. This is the giant aneurysm. This is the CT scanner. This is the neck. I decide to treat it only to coiling the posterior communicant artery and posterior cerebral artery. This is the collateral leptomeningeal circulation and the patient is totally occluded, stable, more than 15 years of, of uh, follow-up. And finally, it's a uh, difficult case because I have the middle term follow-up, but also it's possible to see what is the evolution. 53 year old, this is the MR. You are the mass effect and gliosis, gliosis in the thalamus mesencephalo with giant aneurysms. These giant aneurysms have flow here, 
a thrombus here. This is the initial angio. The P posterior cerebral artery and superior cerebral artery born in the end of the aneurysm and the posterior cerebral artery and superior cerebral artery stay safe of the aneurysm. This is partial reopening thrombosis and aneurysm of serpiginous. I decide to use some Leo stain because it's different size, the distal part of the initial part. I put seven Leo stain. This is the first, okay, this is the stain. But this is the evolution, initial, presenting one month, two months, six months. Very good picture. The patient is stable, but this is the 2010, February is the final control. One year later, the anivis regrowth after seven layers. I decide this is the angel, you are the endolink. In this point, also in this point. Look the endolink, look the contrast here. At this moment, the discussion is bypass, more flow, overlapping, puppy line at this moment, proximal occlusion, holidays. I decide to treat, to put some more Leo stand to cover this endolink. But at the procedure, the Leo stand produce one occlusion of the posterior cerebral artery. I decide to perform a balloon remodeling to open this, but in this moment, I rupture the end part of the junction of the posterior cerebral artery. And I decide very quickly to close this vessel with coiling to preserve the patient. to stop the bleeding. One week later, this is the infection, or two, two weeks later, and the patient death because half edema and ischemia. Okay, it's only to present, thank you for your attention, to present the different, different situation, and thank, thank you very much to the panelists to, to help me to narrow imaging. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lewis. So it's time for the floor to so our questions or share idea or experience. Does anyone have questions? Any? I think there was one or two in the chat. Uh, let me let me oh, get. Yeah, let me, yeah. Did you see any in the chat there, Warlock? Oh. Okay. So the first questions from the, I guess, Dr. Mario is the, for the question for Professor Juha. He asks like, in which cases do you decide to do a bypass before clipping? Uh, bypass, bypass doesn't help in any way in basilar bifurcation or basilar superior cerebral aneurysms, but may, maybe in the P1 aneurysms you might do if you are trapping the aneurysm. So this is... Uh, 
not uh, good to uh, touch on. I have been helped by the world champions in fiber surgery. So, but I don't see any indication to do in basilar bifurcation or basilar scar, superior separate artery, and I don't see any indications. In the absence of treatment, the three last lectures, there was no microneural surgery. It is still existing and good treatment for many of these cases. So you will find some of the last Mohicans to do good microneural surgery and also younger virtua virtualist virtuos who can do and clip aneurysms. One of the drawbacks of endovascular surgery is that it's extremely expensive. So we are now what we are speaking, this is first world uh, surgery. So I was working in Nepal, now in China. So who is coming to endovascular surgery? Those who have money. And those who have no money, they might have open microneural surgery. In Nepal, it was so the people didn't have money even for a clip. So a clip is three to $500. A stent is 100 times more. So if you push several stents, so you quickly push money for a car or for a house inside this large center. So this is a question and you should think about it because for example, in China, you have 4 million aneurysms running around, 4 million people with aneurysms. So if you treat them all with these expensive means, so this huge number of money and the same counts for every, every big country. And the bigger the country, the more poor, the worse is the follow-up. So in most big countries, you don't have any follow-up of the cases. So follow-up means that you have 100% of follow-up and many years ahead. So then you know all the complications. I have been close to 50 years in neurosurgery and I have seen all kinds of things. Weird things in open micro-neurosurgery, open micro of course, but also in endovascular. So it is not so that easy case, easy case like I hear in many congresses. Uh, it was uh, very good to hear these honest endovascular lectures telling about complications and difficult cases. Thank you. I have been, I was talking too much and I have been talking 30 years about endovascular surgery. So I have been involved too much maybe in that. I can only tell that I was getting endovascular surgery in mid seventies and Guglielm is my good friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Duha. And next questions, uh, asking Professor Rainey Chappell said, when there is an edema, I believe in the endovascular case, do you need to use any medical treatment? Or which type, I guess, that's the question. Okay. No, yeah. I, I don't, I'm not sure if he's here. He may have uh, stepped, you may have stepped if, away. If uh, Dr. Louis or Dr. Gorilla can answer that in, uh, instead of Dr. Professor Rene. Este, esteroid, esteroid. I, the patient I treated by esteroid. Oh, steroid. Esteroid. And you, Gula? Micro, micro. Hmm. Mm, 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 is he here? I'm not sure. <coughs> yeah, oh, yeah, he's here. Yeah, unmute there. Okay, I'll ask you to un unmute. Okay. Having trouble with the unmute there. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Okay, there you go. There you go. Yeah, sorry. So, so we have it. We have the steroid, of course, standby, but I only use it when it, it, the patient has clinical signs of, uh, of uh, uh, edema. I don't go on the images because <clears throat> I did it when I was younger and not so experienced, and the patient got psychiatric uh, symptoms afterwards. So, so then I learned it that the steroid has this uh, uh, side effect also. So I don't use it just in a preventive uh, fashion just if it is clinically motivated. I, I, I have a, a, one a question to Professor Bing. Uh, why do you perform, or if you have experience to, to perform the bypass 
in the posterior cerebral artery? Uh, <laughs> yeah, actually, my experience is uh, uh, similar uh, with uh, Professor Yuha. The, for the basal tip aneurysm, uh, it's no uh, need to do some bypass, but the PCA, some, sometimes it, uh, if you uh, like uh, occlude the proximal part of the PCA, you may need uh, some bypass. But uh, before you treat it, you can use small balloon to occlude it and uh, test uh, uh, the collateral blood flow. If it's uh, tolerable, it can uh, tolerate the uh, long occlusion test. You can uh, occlude the PCA directly. And uh, sometimes I use uh, staged occlusion of the, uh, like P1, if, the, if it's a PCA giant aneurysm, just as you should in the case, similar technique. But uh, the first stage, I will uh, partially calling the uh, proximal part of the aneurysm. Then but the, maybe, uh, the bypass don't work very well. Because, you know, if it's only PCA territory, mostly the MCA territory uh, and the ACA territory uh, can collateral, have some collateral flow from distal part to the proximal part. So normally, I don't need the direct bypass. One question for you, Hap. Please, uh, uh, Professor Yuha, well, in my presentation, I talk some, some comments to the inversion of the flow, progressive inverted flow with the balloon. Why do you please to talk with uh, your clipping, clip, hydrogenemic clip to progressive inversion flow in basilar territory? You have some comments? Is this yeah, the slow closing clip is extremely good idea because even in the endovascular surgery, I see in the desperate cases, you have to do desperate treatments. This is occlude the uh, proximal artery. So the slow closing clip is excellent idea. Unfortunately, we don't have it uh, ready. So one Shanghai group is working on it. I have to connect them if they can do it or not. Maybe it is not big market, big market. This is one of the difficulties. If you, can, if you can sell something that you can sell to mm -hmm. 100,000, 1 million people, then it's different. Then you can, a device, device you can use seldom. So about the P1 bypass, so I, I can mention, I studied all the cases of Dr. Drake and PL. So Dr. Drake was successful in occluding uh, posterior cerebral artery without any infarctions uh, in around 50 cases. So it was interesting, interesting. So in, even in the posterior cerebral artery, you don't need or seldom need bypass, but like Subin said, you can, Nowadays, you can have test occlusion. And so there are many but, things you, can, you cannot do if you cannot find a big market. Good but ideas. The, but the proximal part of P1 occlusion is dangerous because you have some perforate branch. Like I told you, Dr. Drake was able to do in big number of cases. So maybe he... He was good in selecting the cases, but uh, usually if, if a regular neurosurgeon put, put the uh, occludes PCA, like you said, so that is an infarction, infarction, but uh, some people can do it. Of course, if you go close to the basilar tip, then you have some perforators there, but you, usually you can do it without. Thank you. John, finish, no? Okay, very good. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. And Lewis, we're going to have another webcast in two weeks, right? In two weeks. In yeah, two what, weeks. do you have a topic at, uh, yet? Yes, a, a giant anevris of the siphon, carotid siphon. Okay, very good. We look forward to that. And thank you, Ben, for translating it to, into Chinese. And thanks, uh, Dr. Gao, Yuha. And Morlux, thanks for your debut as an announcer. 
Uh, <laughs> okay, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, thank you, thank okay. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Second. Is that Chinese, right? Yes, yes. Oh, that's great. That's great. Good education. I speak. <laughs> Good education. Hasta luego, señores. Okay, thank you. I have to close, oh. everybody. I have to close. Thanks, you.